They went from contracepting newlyweds to parents of 14 children still alive and others who are not. And they did so by overcoming fear with faith and hope. And you'll meet them tonight on EWTN Live, so please stay with us. Thank you and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Packle. Welcome to EWTN Live, our chance to bring you guests from all over the world. Uh, before we get to our guest tonight, I want to mention that today is the Feast of St. Martin of Tours. He was born in 316, the son of a soldier, who himself entered the military. But after an encounter with Christ, he gave up his military career, which is quite promising, and he decided to uh, go become a monk. And on the way, he met a beggar and took half of his cloak. Usually you see him uh, being pictured with his cloak torn in half and giving it to a poor beggar because he combined a concern for the need of the poor with real religious conviction and reform. Eventually he became the Bishop of Tours and was very active in bringing peace in the church and bringing resolution to some difficulties in what was then the province of Gaul. He died in 397, a much beloved bishop and still is one of the most popular saints from France. Also, I want to mention uh, a couple other issues. Today, of course, is Veterans Day. And it's appropriate to mention all those who are still fighting our wars and those who have died in them. We particularly, of course, are well aware of those who died uh, in a horrible attack uh, done last week. And we pray for their souls, but also for their families. I uh, want to keep them and all the military families in our prayers. This is a very great sacrifice that they make for our sake. And the very at least grateful we can be is to show that, that we care about them. And then also one other little thing, uh, well, it's not little, it's important. Uh, the health care bill had passed in Congress, but at least two of the representatives are extremely upset. Uh, one, uh, DeJet from uh, Cal Colorado and uh, Wolseley from California. And they're upset that a pro-life protection was included. And they want to go after the bishops and send the IRS after them to take away you know, their tax exemption and all this and investigate them because they think they went beyond their bounds and they use that kind of language. Shame on them. Shame on them that it was members of Congress, a number of Democrats, who got very much involved in making sure that that pro-life uh, measure was included because long ago, Congress had already voted that federal funds should not go for killing children in the womb. And they're just trying to guarantee it, and so are the bishops. Shame on these people who are trying to, to threaten us with the IRS. The bishops are our point men on this. And we are going to stand up. We've seen a pattern of, them, of various politicians trying to make the bishops into enemies. Kathleen Kennedy Townsend did that in the summertime. Patrick Kennedy tried it last month. And now these two representatives from California and Colorado are trying it this week. Enough. We Catholics are going to stand by the bishops because they stand by life. And that's going to be our commitment for the unborn and for their families. So let's be strong on that, huh? Now tonight, we want to talk about dealing with people who are pro-life. Uh, our guests are going to speak volumes to our fear-driven culture, a culture afraid of babies, afraid of births, crazy culture. And they're going to do so simply by their presence in ordinary places like the grocery store or restaurants. 
They are the parents of 14 living children. They were, and they're challenging the culture's oftentimes very self-centered approach to love, marriage, and children in their new book, which is called Better by the Dozen Plus Two. So please welcome our guests, James and Kathleen Littleton. Kathleen, welcome. Father. James, Thank you. welcome. Thank you. So you come from the area of my sweet home, Chicago, right? That's correct. Uh, south side suburbs? South suburbs, yes. Yeah, Frankfurt. Good, good, good to have you here. Welcome. Thank and you. you have 14 children who are alive, we mentioned. Right. But you had lost five children yes. in miscarriages? Yes. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. So, and, and that's, you know, some people would say, oh, you know, well, at least you don't have so many kids, but that's, that's a false attitude. Losing a child in miscarriage is a real trauma. Yes, I mourned, I mourned each of those losses. Absolutely. It's, there's an empty place in my heart, but we know they're in heaven and they're yeah. saints, you know, by the fact that they were innocent and they're up there interceding for us now. We call them our little, our little family team, yeah. praying for us and helping us get through life. They're the team that's made it. Yeah, yes. but yeah. yeah, the culture really does um, sell short and underestimate the value of life across the board, but most certainly uh, when it comes to miscarriage, and the miscarriage is the true loss of a child. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Having counseled many families over these right. years, uh, you know, I'm well aware that that's a painful experience for right. anybody, no matter what stage of the miscarriage. What has so, helped us is to name each of our children oh, yeah. and uh, to remember them at our masses and unite yeah. ourselves with them. Yeah, yeah, yes. good, good. The, um, the, and, and also, I think I, I read your book and you said that if it's possible, if it looks like the child may have died recently, to baptize the child too yes. is important. Yes. yes. And even if it, if it isn't possible, you can have a baptism by desire. Right. Meaning that you as parents wanted to have this child exactly. baptized. Exactly. So even right. if it's not physically possible to baptize the child, you can do that by the church's teachings. And that would be in the case of a, of a child who died well before and the womb is already decayed, as they said, which sometimes happens. Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, different kinds of miscarriage. Yes. But you also treated them with respect. You buried them. Yes, we were able to bury most of most of those babies, mm -hmm. um, with mm -hmm. the exception of one, which again was too early on in the on the pregnancy. Sure. But yes, and um, you know we we have grave markers for them as well, and we go to visit their graves. And the children, when they you know recite the family's names or even sign all the names of our family members, they include the five miscarried children by well, name and greeting cards to relatives cool. at Christmas time and things like that. An interesting story regarding one of our miscarried children named Francis Xavier. Um, we chose a, a, a grave marker for the child and when I first went to visit the grave, I looked up and I saw a statue just to the left and it was a statue of a nun embracing a child overlooking the grave of my child and that saint was Saint Francis Xavier. And, and this was a girl child? We weren't we, able to tell, oh, we so we named us. first name, well, that's female, middle name, exactly. yeah, yeah, male. Yeah, yeah. Francis Xavier, because there's, there's a Jesuit Saint Francis Xavier, and, mm -hmm. and then a Chicago Saint. Yes, correct. Because Saint Francis Xavier Cabrini, Cabrini died in Chicago. Yes. Keeping it local, I like that. <laughs> now, I mentioned at the outset, you two weren't always looking forward, like you didn't start off marriage saying, oh, let's have 14, 19 children. No. That is, Tell us a little bit about that. Well, we, we talked about having five, which we thought was a large family. Yeah, and having a lot control, of people do. Having control over that number. Um, but in fact, we started off our marriage contracepting, using the pill, uh, which we've since learned is it can have abortifacient properties as well. Right. Um, Did you, let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. Were you aware that the church forbade using the pill? I believe that I was, but I was totally indifferent to that because I did not have the faith. And as a matter of fact, when we went through our pre cana program, the priest told us that it was okay to use contraception. Mm -hmm. But I have to admit at that time, I would have done it anyways mm -hmm. because I was not living the faith. Mm -hmm. How about you? Well, because <clears throat> actually it would affect you more personally. Yes, we were both very in into our careers, you know, newly married, everybody else we knew our age was contracepting. I was um, working as a lawyer in downtown Chicago. Mm -hmm. You know, the last thing my bosses wanted me to do was get pregnant. Mm -hmm. um, and we had, 
you know, student loans to pay off, and we were just really kind of just focused on living the high life, you know, making money and pursuing a career. Yeah. And then after a while, I, I realized that I, I felt like I was missing something and wasn't really sh content with the job. It was very challenging, but inside I still felt that there was something else that I wanted to do with my life and not work 60 hours a week in downtown Chicago. Instead work every hour, every day, <laughs> seven days a week as a mom. Yes, but there's <laughs> eternal blessings with this yeah. job. So. Yeah. So after a while, I mean, I think it was just a grace of the Holy Spirit, I actually stopped taking the pills. Um, a little bit naive on my part, I don't even think I mentioned it to Jim, but... Um, <laughs> you did. It was just... Is that, is yeah, that's yeah, correct, that's I was not true. aware of that. I see. But so, I'm surprise, very surprise, happy in retrospect. Right. And, uh, you know, within a month, I think I conceived, because I started um, thinking I was gaining weight, went to the doctor, and when I went to the doctor the first time, I was already four and a half months pregnant. So it was the shortest pregnancy in my life. What do you mean short? How, when did it end? Well, four and a half months later, when our first oh, child okay. was born. You just didn't realize right, you the first exactly. four and a half, so it <laughs> yes. went by fast. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so it doesn't say much for me being open and honest with my husband at the time, but again, I, I knew that we both wanted children, and why were we putting it off? And it was just, I didn't realize it would happen so quickly. Jim, so. let me ask you. I mean, this is a big surprise. I mean, there's surprises. Oh, right. we've got steak for dinner. <laughs> right. But there are other surprises right. like, oh, and I'm having a baby too. Um, uh, what was your reaction? Well, my, I was happy about the news. I, I really was. And then once we had the first child, I figured, well, our life has changed. We don't have the freedom to go wherever we want and do whatever we want, so let's have more children. And that carried us through to about number five. Um, <laughs> but um, whether we would have gone p past that, I doubt, except that I had a conversion experience. Mm -hmm. Very powerful. How so? Well, um, had you always been Catholic? I had, already, I had been raised Catholic, but I was not a practicing Catholic. I went to Mass on Sunday when it was very convenient, when I frankly wasn't uh, too hungover. Um, uh -huh. uh, and uh, so at any rate... Um, yeah, yeah, it's never good to drink and pray. No. <laughs> so um, I heard that the Blessed Mother was appearing at a cemetery uh, nearby, Queen of Heaven Cemetery mm -hmm. in Chicago. And so I packed the family up and we went there really more looking for science, looking for s some, some, see something marvelous as opposed to pursuing the faith. Although I did have something, a devotion carrying over from my childhood towards the Blessed Mother. Um, we did not see any signs, we did not see any miracles, we were hungry looking for that sort of thing. But what did happen in retrospect is that I was touched by the faith of the people who were there and the way that they prayed and the way that they were devout. Um, and I also recognized in retrospect, although I didn't know what it was at the time, that I was touched by God, by the Blessed Mother in my heart. And I believe my conversion uh, began very powerfully at that time. Someone there handed me a holy card, simple holy card, 15 promises of Mary to those who pray the rosary. And as I recall, I put that on my dresser and left it there for about a year. But each time I would walk by it, I would think, you know what, maybe I should pick up the rosary. Eventually I did. I had to read some of the prayers. I, I, I couldn't remember them. And I started out with one decade of the rosary believing that that was about as much as any man could possibly be expected to pray in one day. That was a <laughs> marathon of prayer for me. But once I did that, and, and, I'm, and I will shout this to the rooftops, once you, you begin your devotion to the Blessed Mother, she will take over your spiritual life and lead you to Jesus. And it's just amazing looking back how she led me then to daily mass and eventually to bring my family to daily mass and Eucharistic uh, adoration and to learn so many things about the faith and to start on the road to lead sin behind, the road that I'm still on, but um, to work hard at you that. You too? <laughs> yeah. I as well. Yes. Now, this is Jim's conversion. How about you? I mean, you just sort of snuck this in there, uh, but was there anything spiritually going on that to get you to say, you know, I don't want to contracept anymore? I want to be open to life? Well, besides that first grace-filled moment when I went off the pill, really for a few years after that, <clears throat> like Jim said, until after we had our fifth, it was pretty much life as usual. I was just busy with the children. Jim started to undergo this, this major embracing of the Catholic faith and studying the teachings, the Humana Vitae. He would tell me about it. I would, um, you know, listen. He would encourage me to go to Mass with him. Mm -hmm. um, 
I had seven excuses, you know, ages seven on down to zero. One in my womb usually, those were my excuses for not going to daily mass. And then after time, um, years went by. This was probably another six years. Finally, I, I said, yes, I'll go with you. Um, I, want to, I want to try this out as a family. And from that day on, I never turned back. That was over 10 years ago, going to daily mass mm -hmm. as a family, um, every one of us together. And it's something we've embraced along with family evening prayer, um, frequent confession, um, a lot of other beautiful practices of the faith, Eucharistic adoration. But it was a process. It did not happen overnight for me. All right, now, bringing uh, you know, a group of up to 14 children yes. to daily mass, uh, it's not easy because the last five minutes before the car leaves, I got to go to the bathroom, right. change that diaper, and, right. and all those little things. Right. I can't find my shoes, exactly. and all these things that happen, right? Right, definitely. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. And do, do the kids go with you to Mass? Yes, yes. 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 And the solution to that, by the way, is to plan to leave 15 minutes earlier than you need to. Okay. knowing that there will always be some emergency like you described. Yes. And uh, yeah, and as a matter of fact, part of my conversion story as well is I started going to daily mass by myself. But o over a short time, I became convicted that if this is the most important thing I could do with my life, with my time, how can I justify leaving my children behind? Of course, yeah. I invited Kathleen. I couldn't make her go, but I could at least really make the kids start going. Right and then they learn to love it. As a matter of fact, now and for many years, that's the expectation. It's Did like, they object at first? I, they were too young to object. And that's <laughs> another thing we like to emphasize is that you know it's so much easier to start your children and form your children in, in the Catholic faith and yeah. going to Mass when they're little. Um, it's much harder, I'm sure, later when they're teenagers to then you'll get the objections. But sure. our children have been raised in this way of life. And as a matter of fact, the other day I was too sick to go to Mass and my little ones were like, Mom, aren't we going to Mass today? It was the first time in their lives, literally, that they hadn't gone to Mass. So it was unusual not to go to Mass. Mm -hmm. And it's just, just the way we live. Now, there, there are a couple other things. You know, besides your own, and this is really a, an example of a father taking spiritual leadership here, yeah. huh? Yeah. And, and going forward. But there are a lot of other issues that come up. Uh, they all eat every day, right? So you, know, you can yes. afford to feed them. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that, that's no small issue, is it? <clears throat> no. Yeah. No, that, that keeps you right on the, the edge. And um, did, what about the house chores? Do, do you have to do it all? No. As a matter of fact, when um, I was expecting our twins, um, our oldest child was only 10. And I was bedridden in the hospital for about six weeks. So Jim is very similar to the father in the original movie, Cheaper by the Dozen, an efficiency expert and a delegator, master delegator. So he taught all the children to do everything that I used to do when I was home. Um, you know, simple things, making a simple meal, putting laundry in, so that we actually developed a system called charge masters and charges. So that the older children were paired up with the younger ones and the house ran very efficiently. And so when I came back, um, you know, they didn't even really need me much. So it was a very beautiful thing. It's out of necessity, but then we realized that this works and why not continue the practice? By the way, do these kids hire out? <laughs> People have asked, yes. I, I arranged that as a matter of survival. I said, I cannot do everything that Kathleen was doing. And, right. I, and I realized that, you know what? These children at this age are really capable of a lot more than I had realized at that time. And really, it just helps them to grow in responsibility, maturity, generosity. We're doing no favors to our children by, by coddling them and giving yeah. them everything they yeah. want, everything they ask for, without demanding sacrifice from them. Yeah, yeah. It's really created a beautiful um, sibling <coughs> bond between the older children and their little charges. Now that some of them are off to college, um, our family is extremely tight-knit. When the children come home from college, it's like that's where they want to spend their evenings, is home with the family and not going out. It's, it's something almost very unusual. Yeah. But, um, even, almost. <laughs> well, I, I can't speak for other families, but I know growing up in my family, it was unusual for me.